All right. Well, we do have a long evening ahead of us, so I am going to get started in the interest of time. So good evening and welcome to Wu, U Wu University's presentation, Thyroid and Thyroid Eye Disease, Clinical Pearls and Innovations for 2023 with Dr. Gregory Caldwell. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Stewart. It is my great, great pleasure to introduce, introduce Dr. Greg Caldwell. He's a 1995 graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. He completed a one-year residency in primary eye and ocular disease at the Eye Institute of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomat of the American Board of Optometry, a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society, and a member of the Optometric Wellness and Nutritional Society. He currently works in Duncansville, Pennsylvania as an ocular disease consultant. His primary focus is the diagnosis and management of anterior and posterior segment ocular disease, and he's been a participant in multiple FDA investigations and trials. He has integrated nutrition, prevention, and wellness into his patient care. He practices integra integrative optometry. He's a co-founder of Optometric Education Consultants and co-administrator of OCT Connect on Facebook. Dr. Caldwell has lectured extensively throughout the country and over 13 countries internationally. In 2010, he served as president of the Pennsylvania Optometric Association and served on the AOA Board of Trustees from 2013 to 2016. He's the president of the Blair Clearfield Association for the Blind. So with that, Dr. Caldwell, I'm going to turn it over to you, but I will be here in the background to interrupt you with great questions as we go. Perfect. Thanks, Dr. Stewart. And appreciate the kind introduction and great housekeeping. Um, these are my financial disclosures, everyone. Uh, nice laundry list here. I don't put this here really to impress anyone. I put this here so that... Uh, because we have to disclose them, and I do this type of work so that why does a how can a guy from Duncansville, Pennsylvania, have the honor and privilege to be able to speak uh, to colleagues, you know, at what I feel is at a high level to bring education, and it's because I'm plugged in uh, to these companies. The good news is all of them have been mitigated. All the financial relationships have been mitigated. So we are going to do thyroid and thyroid eye disease, clinical pearls and innovations, 2023. And again, I had the disclosures built in so you get to see it twice. What I like to point out is that this was independently prepared by me. It has no influence. And uh, the content and format of this course is presented without commercial bias and does not claim any superiority or commercial uh, superiority of any product that I, that I do uh, mention. And with that being said, again, all have been mitigated. So here's my practice. Um, I do see patients Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, electronic health records, normal exam room, have an optical, electronic health records, optical contact lenses, lots of fun equipment. And what I like to point out is I'm a clinician first, then a scientist, right? A lot of times we hear a lot of science talks. They're scientists first, then clinician. Um, I need to simplify for the patient and for patient care. We get all this great science, but how do we translate? A lot of times all we're doing is being translators from that optometric language uh, or that science language to our, you know, I guess, you know, everyday patient language. Uh, science is great, but if there's no ap a clinical application, how great is it? You know, some lectures are science-based without clinical application. This lecture is going to be a hybrid. So we're going to kind of take what's out there and kind of show you how to apply it clinically. So, you know, we all have our comfort zone and this kind of tonight, we're going to talk about thyroid eye disease and maybe that we're going to talk about Tepeza at some point. Um, and we might have a fear of prescribing Tepeza because we have the lack of confidence uh, that's out there with it. So that's why we take this uh, continuing education so that we can, you know, deal with these problems you know, acquire this new skill, and then we move into a growth phase. You might hear me reference this a couple times throughout the night. Maybe we're kind of busting through that, through that fear zone that's out there. Now, one of the cool things, you know, Dr. Stewart did a great job of doing my bio there. And my whole life, pretty much, I was this disease guy, right? I'm an ocular disease consultant for uh, down in Duncansville. But you know, I had patients coming into me years ago saying, well, what about this supplement for diabetes and macular degeneration? And I heard like selenium and zinc is good for thyroid. And I kept saying, well, 
That is true. I'm not going to poo poo kind of the natural part of this, um, but I don't know. I don't know. Then I started digging into it. And then I found uh, A4M, the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. It's been around for 30 years. The big meetings in Las Vegas uh, once a year, typically in December. And I've been attending that. And I learned a couple new skills by attending that meeting. I grew up in an allopathic setting, right? If you have a sty, you give an antibiotic. If you have inflammation, iritis, you give a steroid. So I haven't gone alternative where I'm using vitamins and things like that to treat styes, but a lot of us do what's called integrative medicine. Um, and tonight you're going to hear me talk, you know, well, why do we have so much thyroid disease um, that's out there? You know, is it an oxidative stress? Is it a gut issue? And what can we do as optometry? I think there are things that we could do and I'll kind of weave that into this presentation. So here it is, A4M. I attended last year, December 9th. Again, it was their 30th year. Uh, here I am uh, trying this kind of light mask, looks like a blue type of maybe low light type of therapy here. Learned a lot about the mitochondria, big exhibit hall. You know, I was geeking out in it. I was in it for at least four to six hours walking around, just kind of learning about all this, in a sense, functional type of medicine. And I'm going to kind of talk two languages tonight. I'll talk allopathic, which we're all kind of familiar with. And then we'll talk some functional medicine as we go along, and I'll try and point that out as we go. And this was one of the lectures that I attended there, uh, Philomena Trinidad, and you know, she's an MD endocrinologist. And one of the biggest things that she was pointing out is that you know we like to kind of separate out thyroid into its own silo. That's what we like to do. Go see the endocrinologist that treats diabetes or that treats the thyroid and so on and so forth. And one of the quick things she pointed out was there was, you know, an allopathic doc trying to fix this person. They kind of had this thyroid issue and, uh, you know, the numbers really weren't adding up the T3, T4, TSH. And when she, they went and saw this doc, she basically fixed their insulin resistant problem, which then triggered a nice cascade of events. And then their thyroid kind of got back into alignment here. So well, first thing I want to point out is kind of think of this, you know, this hormonal symphony that she has trademarked, that all of these kind of work together. You get one that's kind of working faster or slower, you can start, you know, affecting some of the other hormonal uh, uh, systems that are that are out there. So we're going to talk about thyroid disease and thyroid eye disease. You know, Tepeza has brought this to be kind of cool. We see all these advertisements. Patients are asking, hey, I got thyroid. Is this Tepeza for me? You know, I'm, I'm on Synthroid, so on and so forth. And I'm really going to challenge everyone to kind of pay attention, you know, the next, you know, kind of hour and 40 minutes, maybe an hour and 35 now. Um, because I'm going to bet everyone that's in patient care that they have a patient that is suffering from thyroid eye disease and, you, and you're not catching it. And you're using Tobradex, you're using Maxitrol, you're using uh, Lodopredinol on these patients. They're not viral, they're not bacterial, you might be blaming allergy or you might be blaming seasonal allergies, but you know, how, you know, I live in Pennsylvania, how can someone, you know, in the dead of winter be getting seasonal allergies? Not to say it can't happen, but we're probably missing some of these thyroid eye disease patients that are out there. And, uh, and we're going to kind of recognize that so we can help these patients. So a question to everyone out there, I usually make this a polling question, but or when I do this live, I ask the audience to, to kind of raise their hand. Um, everyone that's on Synthroid that comes into your office. So we all take a thorough medical history, our technicians or ourselves take that. What medications are you on? What supplements, what vitamins, so on and so forth. And is everyone that is on Synthroid at risk for thyroid eye disease? That's the first question I want you to ask yourself. And then what type of disease is thyroid eye disease? How would you classify it? Would you classify it as a cornea problem? You know, where would you send it? You know, a retina problem. What type of condition is it? So the first question here, now that you have time to kind of think about it, does everyone that's on Synthroid at risk for thyroid eye disease? And the answer is no. 
And what type of disease is it? This is an orbital disease. I can tell you when I do it live, people struggle with it. They kind of all look at each other, trying to find an answer as I'm walking around. You know, it's not cornea, it's not retina, it's not anterior seg, it's not oculoplastics. Neuro can get involved because of the compressive or ischemic optic neuropathy, but it's an orbital disease and we're going to kind of come back on that. So not everyone on Synthroid is at risk and I want you to kind of remember orbital disease. The thyroid uh, is part of the endocrine system. We talked about that earlier. You know, I have down here, there's two types of glands. We know that there's more than two types of glands, but for this talk, we're talking about endocrine and exocrine glands. And the endocrine system is controlled by a ductless endocrine gland, basically using hormones that circulate out through the body, through either the lymph system, uh, the bloodstream to reach these dis distant organs. So really there's no tubes, right? There's no ducts being used. So what are those uh, endocrine systems? The hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, the thyroid, the parathyroid. I'm not going to read this whole list to you. And you can see which are considered part of the endocrine system or these glands use a ductless system, limped in blood <clears throat> to carry around those chemical messengers. Um, and in this case, with thyroid, we're talking about the hormones. Exocrine is basically using ducts, ducts that are tubes leading from glands to a target organ. I like the pancreas. So an example would be the digestive enzymes um, that are out there. So I like the pancreas because in a sense, it's both exocrine and endocrine. The exocrine side is the part of the pancreas that actually secretes digestive enzymes using those tubes into the small intestine and helping us with digestion. But then the exocrine side is using insulin and glucagon to regulate those blood sugar levels. So blood sugar goes up, we get a squirt of insulin, it helps deposit into the different cells of the body. So I like to remember that the pancreas is both exocrine and endocrine. The thyroid, it's the largest endocrine gland in the body, butterfly shaped, two lobes. I think we all kind of know where it's located just below the, the skin and muscle surface. And its purpose is to produce T3, T4, and calcitrin, right? T4 is kind of, the, if you could say, the precursor to T3. We need to have selenium and zinc to convert that, and it produces calcitrin. Now, this whole lecture is going to be not about T3, T4, in calcitrin. Dr. Lee is an ophthalmologist. He's a neuro-ophthalmologist, and he's very uh, inspiring when you le listen to him lecture. And he always talks about this superpower that we get as optometrists and ophthalmologists, neuro-ophthalmologists, neuro in order to you know solve some of these patients' um, crises sometimes, some of their mysteries, what's going on. And tonight, your superpower is not going to be learning about T3, T4, TSH. That's probably the rabbit hole that you've gone down. What we're going to learn tonight in this condition is about the thyroid antibodies that are out there. So even though the body, the thyroid produces T4 and T3, which then goes to the nucleus of the cell to create the action that we're looking for, the thyroid eye disease part is really about the antibodies that we're going to talk about. So what happens is we have thyroid releasing hormone up here at the hypothalamus area. We that through that ductless system goes down and talks to the anterior pituitary and then produces thyroid stimulating hormone, which then again through that ductless blood, through that ductless system using blood or lymph, that TSH talks to the receptors of the gland and produces T4, which then gets converted to T3, and that's what is metabolically active within the nucleus uh, of the cells. So here's the whole lecture right here. This guy walks in, and you can see he has a little bit of some upper lid retraction, a little bit of redness, his eyes are bulging slightly. 
And I walk in and say, hey, you know, patient, how you doing? And the patient says, hey, doc, I'm doing great. But if you tell me to get a thyroid test or if you tell me to, that I have a thyroid problem, that I'm going to get up here and walk out and you don't get my copay. And I said, okay, um, I guess that sounds fair. So uh, basically, I had to sit back and talk to him and look back. And I say, okay, I understand what's going on here. Um, I agree. You probably are getting a lot of thyroid panels and that's probably coming back as normal. Um, but I still believe that there's, you know, an issue with your, you know, with your thyroid and maybe some type of thyroid immune system that is causing your eyes to kind of do this and maybe feel a certain way. And he was like, okay, everyone keeps leaning on this thyroid. Um, but you kind of said it a different way. I'm kind of interested to see where you're going. So this is my patient right here that basically kept getting tested with a thyroid panel and his T3, T4, and TSH were perfectly normal. Uh, and so this is kind of one of the parts of the process here that we want to go through to figure out how that can be and how it was being missed. So it comes down to, you know, thyroid dysfunction. What is the most common cause of thyroid dysfunction? Is it cancer? Is it surgically induced? Is it medication toxicity, pregnancy, uh, or autoimmune? And I think a lot of us out there would answer probably pretty quickly autoimmune. Um, let me just kind of digress here from the slide and just kind of just stand, uh, just kind of just talk a little off the slide is that let's say you're having a great day uh, as an optometrist, right? You do your confrontation fields and you pick up on this bitemporal hemianopia. You run the visual field and it's classic. You know, you order the MRI, you call the primary care doctor up, the patient has uh, a pituitary, you know, adenoma. And you're with the, you're with the person that found it. They go and have the, the tumor removed. They go up to the nose, tumors removed, but their pituitary gland is now missing. And we remember they had thyroid releasing hormone that produces thyroid stimulating. And that thyroid stimulating has got to go chalk through that bl blood, blood system or lymph system, that ductless system to talk to the receptors. But now we don't have any TSH to talk. So the patient ends up on Synthroid. Is that patient at risk for thyroid eye disease? And I'm going to pause and let you kind of think of that for a second, what your answer would be. And to me, everyone's at risk, but that one's at very, very low risk, or I would say, you know, no risk based upon what we just talked about. Autoimmune is, that's not an autoimmune, that was cancer, right? They had cancer pituitary adenoma, they removed it, so that was surgically induced. Autoimmune is your body produces what that attacks itself. Well, the body produces antibodies, and if you really want to get really you know, fancy is immunoglobulins, right? And we learned about, you know, you know, immunoglobulin, you know, IgE and IgG and there's IgM and so on and so forth, the different immunoglobulins. But it's a dysfunction to our immune system that creates these antibodies, which then go and attack our thyroid. So you can have a primary dysfunction a couple different ways. I already kind of talked about the secondary right here. You have a great day as an optometrist. You have a pituitary adenoma and the pituitary gland is removed. There's no TSH to come down. Someone could have a stroke or an infarct or closed head trauma, maybe some damage to the hypothalamus. And then what happens is there's no thyroid releasing hormone to produce the thyroid stimulating. That would be kind of a, of a tertiary or someone has thyroid cancer, right? They have thyroid cancer. They get radiated chemotherapy. You kill the thyroid again, thyroidectomy. There's nothing there to produce the T4 to T3. So they end up on Synthroid. Um, so there's different ways to end up on Synthroid, primary, secondary, or tertiary. This slide here is the most one of the most important slides of the slide deck, and I'm just going to animate it, is that if you really want to be that superhero and solve, learn how to order the thyroid antibody tests. It's very simple. 
thyroid antibody test, right? And there's three different types. There's thyroid stimulating, um, thyroid blocking, and thyroid peroxidase that's typically in that panel. Those are the, that's the dysfunctional part of the immune system, which I'll talk about. You know, we have our innate immune system, we have our adaptive immune system, and then we have the complement system, which is now becoming kind of sexy because of a palace and Iveric bio with their C3 and C5 inhibitors. But the immune system is amazing. The, uh, it's complex. Um, it doesn't like to be monkeyed with. And now between pollutants and our diet and maybe our leaky gut, our leaky gut now is one of the reasons why we think there's a lot of autoimmune or it's been proven that these toxins, and let's talk about that. What is leaky gut? I love doing it at a live meeting because I love seeing the audience's reaction. You know, we put food in our mouth and eventually it makes it through our colon and it exits our body. But in the meantime, it gets into our stomach, into our small intestine, large intestine, and the body is doing its thing, squeezing out the nutrients. Well, in leaky gut, because of the bacterial issue, you know, kind of like our cornea epithelium, if you get a scratch, you can see the sodium fluorescein be pulled into the stroma as that food is going through and what's going through our gut poop what's leaking out poop is leaking out through those cells into our blood into our lymph system and that's why a lot of leaky gut is associated with all kinds of conditions rheumatoid arthritis and uh, thyroid disease and all these different types of atopic dermatitis and psoriatic and so on and so forth you know, that's why they keep saying the, the gut is the second brain. So, you know, we get a trigger to this immune dysfunction, right? The immune system's trying to fight and it becomes dysfunction. And then it starts to attack our own body, our own, our own cells. That's what autoimmune is. Adaptive immune system, innate. Innate is there, adaptive. That's what we needed for COVID. That was the novel coronavirus. The coronavirus was never seen before, but luckily we have an amazing complex immune system that grabbed it, an, and, uh, uh, an antigen presenting cell, grabbed it, took it, went through that whole process of T cells, B cells, interleukins, identified the virus, and then killed the coronavirus. To draw back to that now, it was a new protein to our body, dead protein laying around and our body had to react to that. Again, it's that immune system that goes dysfunction on that innate, I'm sorry, on that adaptive side and creates these antibodies that go and attack the receptors. They attack the receptors of the thyroid gland, right? So this is a this is when you hear that it's an antibody receptor. This these antibodies that we all kind of remember shaped in the form of a Y, they now attach to the receptor and create damage to the receptor. All right, here's another point to the lecture. This is a key point. Well, thyroid eye disease, we said it's an orbital disease. Here's another, just right out of the box, this might as well talk about it because then we'll go through and kind of highlight it as the lecture goes on. It's an orbital disease and it's uh, a, a disease of the fat and muscle inside the orbit along with the conjunctiva. Here's the kicker. Unfortunately, there are receptors on this fat, on this muscle that look like thyroid tissue. And that's why these antibodies that I'm pointing out here and spending so much time on this slide, those antibodies, they attack the receptor, but later can say, hey, look up here, up here in the orbit, look what I found. I found some you know, some tissue that looks like thyroid receptor. Let's move up there. And now you get that inflammation. That is the, the disease process. So if you really want to learn a lot about the immune system, I just about have this almost in every single uh, uh, presentation that I do, because we talk so much about medications and affecting the uh, immune system. I would go to, you know, YouTube and this is a guy, an ninja nerd here, and he basically is teaching medical students and how to pass exams and he's doing all these reviews. 
So over here, he's talking about the innate immune system. And it's awesome because he draws, draws us all out on the whiteboard, switches markers. And then he moves over here to where that antigen presenting cell, that macrophage, brings it in and it starts talking to the different cells, T cells. And then you can see the interleukins and eventually you get the B cells. This is our adaptive immune system. This is what COVID went through. This is what our body does when it encounters something that's foreign and we've never seen it before. It will figure out the code and then make something for it, whether it's an inter, um, interferon or whether it's an antibody uh, and it goes and attacks it. And then this part right here is that MAC complex, the complement system that makes that membrane attack complex. And this is where Iveric and Apelis are. And that's why it's important to know the immune system. But you see these T cells right here? Here are the T cells when they react normal through the interleukins and fives and fours, they produce the B cells. And then it produces, this is when the immune system works properly. So I'd say, go here, listen to this gentleman. He'll walk you through. It's like an eight part series. You know, I listen to it whenever I'm on my way. I live about hundred miles from the airport and I just listen to this and try and, and stay current because all these medications coming out. Now, if you go back all the way to 2002, you can see the immune thyroid new models of cell death and auto immunity. So what we're showing here, remember, here's that T cell. Let's go back. We're talking like right in this area, the T cells. And the T cell is differentiating into B cells and T cells. And what you have here is the plasma and you're making these antibodies. And this is what happens in Hashimoto's. And we now know it's more of a thyroid blocking type of hormone. And over here on Graves' disease, you get the breakdown. The, the dysfunction side of this is that you get that thyroid stimulating antibody. And you can see here how it's attacking the thyroid cells or the thyroid receptor. And that's what's happening is it's attacking the receptors. If it's stimulating, creating that burst of T3, T4, giving that patient at the time of diagnosis, um, that kind of nervous feeling. And if it's blocking, it's kind of slowing things down. I'm also very sensitive when I do this talk because um, I know that, you know, it's one in 13 people um, have uh, a thyroid condition. And I'm looking up here at the participant number. Um, there's over a thousand people in this webinar tonight. I'm going to bet that there's probably someone taking Synthroid from an autoimmune condition in here. So I realize that not only teaching us how to look for thyroid eye disease, but there's probably people that are, you know, have this condition and they might understand their condition a little bit more. If it's autoimmune, it's all about these antibodies. So, you know, we we talk about, you know, genetic testing. We talk about, um, you know, genetics. And so what I'm showing here is that this was a this is for macular degeneration, where it's more of, you know, macular degeneration to me is more of another type of autoimmune appellus and Iveric are kind of now teaching us that by using complement factor three and complement factor four. But I always like to remember here, you know, there's a lot of autoimmune conditions. There's a lot of uh, immune hyperactivity, immune dysfunction. And so here again, we're just kind of digressing away from thyroid, but in macular degeneration down here at the RPE level, we have this genetic SNP, this genetic issue. And then when we get our exercise, you know, we're not as exercising, stressing the body as we should, or recovering, getting that parasympathetic, you know, our breathing exercises, our sleep and then nutrition, all that is needed to help keep that immune system kind of happy, kind of things under bay, kind of keeping the cells or things will start to express or overexpress, get the receptors. And in this case, maybe something like macular degeneration uh, that's out there. And if you recognize the structure and function and uh, treat at times aggressively with that immune system, like this is nothing more a drusen down here that 
is uh, nothing more than the complement system. And all I did for this patient was aggressively treat them with antioxidant therapy. And you can see here's the RPE scar. Within about nine months, we were able to reverse some drusen. So there's a lot of opportunity out here in optometry. You know, I was, as, as Dr. Stewart mentioned earlier, past president of the POA, AOA board, I'm all for lasers, SLT, YAG caps, cutting lumps and bumps off. But we're going to hit a wall over there. And what I think is with all this early diagnosis and recognition, you know, being able to help these patients uh, from a nutraceutical wise, from a nutrition wise, from a healthy uh, lifestyle, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, there was a famous guy that once said that if doctors don't become more like uh, nutritionists, the nutritionists will become more like doctors. Um, and uh, that was me that was the famous guy that that said that. I've been starting to say that now for about the last three or four years. So that's a kind of reminder of how the kind of another example within the eye about how autoimmune or the immune dysfunction, because that's what macular degeneration is, down there at that RPE level, you're kind of having an over-exaggeration of the immune response. Now, in thyroid, remember I talked about that thyroid stimulating. It attacks the thyroid receptors. That spits out T3, T4. Remember, it's a negative feedback loop, so that means TSH will go down, and that's what happens in hyperthyroid. When those antibodies are produced and they're the blocking they hit the thyroid gland, the receptors, and it reduces the T3 and T4, which then your body is saying, hey, I'm getting that feedback loop. Let's jack up the TSH. And that's what we see that happens in hypothyroid. And then the endocrinologist is for the next X amount of years, maybe it's three months, six months, a year, or three years, as these antibodies are attacking the thyroid, the patient that's going through this is going through these periods, right? And those who are out there, they know who you know who you are. This is what was happening. But eventually the receptors, there's a finite amount of them. And now we're done blocking or we're done, you know, stimulating and, and producing or blocking the T3, T4. And now the synthroid starts to regulate. Now, this is what happens a lot. Patients will come in, they have these red eyes that I'm going to teach you about that I think everyone out here has, is that they'll come into my office and maybe I'll do the blood test or I'll say, hey, you know, I think you have thyroid eye disease. We're going to order this. And the patient's um, primary care doc will say, there's no way you can have thyroid eye disease because this is the best your T3, TSH, T, you know, T4 have been. And that's whenever I have to call the, the primary care doc and explain to them that it's not a T3, T4, TSH. It's these antibodies that are now attacking the orbit. And Jen, I see you come online here. Is that a signal that you might have something to, to, to pass along? I do. I have a few questions. This is a good time to to interrupt Perfect. and ask some questions before we, I don't want to get too far away because um, there were a few that just popped up. Um, one question was, will this be recorded and available for review? Yes. Just a reminder before we go forward, there was a reminder in the chat. This is a two hour CE. So you are here for two hours. So I just wanted to remind everyone also, Dr. Caldwell, you especially that we're here for two hours. So, um, so yes, it's a two hour uh, CE, but uh, we do have a few questions before we get too far. People were really interested in um, you treating that drusen. Um, how did you aggressively treat the drusen to get shrinkage? Going back to that. Yeah. And, you know, when we get towards the end here, I'm going to talk a little bit about the functional ways that we can intervene. Um, I do use a comprehensive formula. It's called Life Pack. Um, but for those people, what I did is I real quick to answer the question and then we'll touch it on it at the end. Fish oil is super important, even though AREDS one said that fish oil was not beneficial. Sometimes the science doesn't always match up, um, but it is now showing that fish oil is important that you got to do omega threes. Um, I do an AREDS formula low dose. And then if you look at the frequently asked questions of AREDS, nine out of 10 people were on a, uh, 
uh, we're on a multivitamin. So now I go with a comprehensive A to Z polyphenols, flavonoids, carotenoids, just not carotenoids, but all this comprehensive targeting that outer membrane. And we can do that. And I'm not getting it in every patient, but I'm getting it in a lot of patients. And it's probably because of the different immune systems, the bioindividuality that's out there. But we'll talk about that a little bit more. Perfect. And I think that will answer a few of the other questions we do have that are more on that treatment. So I will hold off on those because I think you'll get to those. So, um, all right. Dr. That Wu's was is going to have to have me come know. back and, and talk about some of this. Yeah. So. so we have lots of questions <laughs> on antioxidant uh, therapy, nutrition, treatment. So um, we will wait till the end for that. <laughs> yeah. The last, the last probably, I don't know, 25% of this will kind of start hitting on that. Awesome. Well, I'm going to go off. Please keep your uh, questions and comments coming and I will interrupt in a few more minutes. And thanks for being a great moderator. Thank you. So we're talking about these antibodies and there's the hypothyroid. So let me just animate this whole slide here. I love this slide whenever I do this live and I say to the audience, okay, here are all the kind of the reasons or the majority of the reasons how thyroid dysfunction can occur. Here's the autoimmune, here's the secondary. Someone can have a toxic adenoma. Someone could have taken an excess amount of iodine and you know, I guess for lack of a better term, fried the receptors, or maybe they had a lithium reaction or it was surgically removed or induced, right? All these people on here are gonna, sometimes some way gonna end up with uh, on Synthroid, but which are the ones at risk for thyroid eye disease? not the secondary and tertiary. Why? They're not autoimmune. What do you need? You're going to get sick and tired of me saying it, but I want to beat it into your head. It's the antibodies, thyroid stimulating, thyroid blocking, thyroid peroxidase that get produced, that go and attack the thyroid, but then unfortunately this orbital disease kind of affects or this orbital disease has receptors that look like thyroid tissue. And that's why we get that reaction. So if you look at Graves' disease, a multi-system disorder, thyro thyroidism, diffuse hyperplasia, infiltrative dermatopathy, right? Um, you hear people that have Graves' disease that the skin around their ankles can hypertrophy, chronic inflammation. Um, the reason being is, is that there's around the ankles, unfortunately, it looks like thyroid tissue. Infiltrative dermatopathy, we kind of hit on that now. We understand that the fat, the muscle, the conjunctiva, it looks like thyroid receptor and those antibodies can attack. Is it a surprise that there's seven to one female to, to male? The answer is no. I love answer, asking us at a live uh, audience is that which, and it should make sense now that you know females versus males, which chromosome does the immune system kind of uh, be determined, right? Is it the X chromosome or the Y chromosome? Well, the, the, the X chromosome kind of handles the immune system. So ladies, you have a double chance of having an immune dysfunction. Us guys only have that one chance. And that's why in these kind of autoimmune or these immune issues that are out there, Usually females are leading it because of the double X that's out there. So there's that genetic link, but it, Graves is usually connected to, uh, to, to uh, thyroid stimulating. Then there's Hashimoto's. This is typically what is the United States. Uh, it's an autoimmune disease. It produces that thyroid blocking or th thyroid peroxidase. It attacks the uh, gland, slows things down, or it's attacking the orbit later in the disease. Again, another autoimmune, it just tells you that there's uh, antibodies, but there's just no goiter present. And then you can get uh, antibodies developed during pregnancy and that's your postpartum thyroiditis. But again, you have thyroid antibodies that are produced. Gonna go through this pretty quickly. I think in all of our years of teaching, we understand that hyperthyroid, nervousness, heat intolerance, man, I can't stand it. It's like 70 degrees in here, but woo, my hot sweating, fatigue, palpitations, tachycardia, as opposed to hypo, things are now weak and now I can't stand the cold or I'm constipated, things aren't moving or there's bradycardia that's out there. So here are the different names. I call it thyroid eye disease. Um, I like these other names down here, thyroid associated orbitopathy, because it reminds us that it's an orbital disease. Again, thyroid orbitopathy, uh, ophthalmic graves. That's usually for hyper. That's why I kind of skip over this, but it says graves orbitopathy, kind of remembering 
that it's an orbital disease, inflammatory, again, that it's that uh, uh, autoimmune part that's out there. So why is this, you know, so confusing? You know, it's often seen in conjunction with Graves' disease. It's often seen with Hashimoto's and people without evidence. This was the guy that walked into my office and said, hey, you know, if you tell me I have a thyroid problem, go get me tested. I'm not paying my copay and I'm walking out of here. So this is where my gentleman was. He had no evidence um, of kind of thyroid dysfunction, but he was having the thyroid eye disease that was out there. And we'll talk about that. So why is it confusing? The symptoms usually occur at the same time. However, they may precede, they may they might show up later. Remember, it has nothing to do, and I'm lying just a smidge to you. I'm going to take it back on another slide. It really has nothing to do with the T3, T4, TSH. When we talk about this orbital disease, this chronic inflammation, it's always about the antibodies, and it's when those antibodies find the tissue up in the orbit. So it can be at the same time as the dysfunction, but it also could be years later once the endocrinologist gets the T3, T4, and TSH balanced out. So that's really the key that's out there. And that's why successful treatment of the thyroid gland does not guarantee the eyes will improve. Because once you get the gland straightened out, those antibodies, that autoimmune disease is now still has the antibodies, which then can go and attack the orbit. So treating and getting T3, T4, TSH all under control doesn't really mean that those antibodies are now not going to say, hey, look what I found up here in these orbits. I found some fat. I found some muscle that have this receptor on it. So thyroid disease, commonly known as Gray's orbitopathy. All right. So let's see if what I what I hear. Okay. This is what I like doing um, when I'm at a, at a live conference here. I like to say, okay, we have over a thousand people here tonight. So let's say all of us here tonight, we're in a thyroid eye disease support group. We all have thyroid eye disease. We're here to kind of be support of each other. If I would say how many of you here at that time were diagnosed as hyper, 80% of you would raise your hand. How about how many of you were hypo, 10% would raise your hand. And how about the guy that walked in? Well, 80, 90 10%, 10% of the people kind of have this normal thyroid function, T3, T4, TSH, and but they're having the, the, the orbitopathy, the chronic inflammation. So when someone comes into my office, another clinical pearl here, I'll try and point them out between all of this kind of lecturing that's going on tonight. When people come into my office, I try to figure out Okay, you're on Synthroid. How did you get there? I had cancer, radiation, surgically removed. Okay, very, very low risk because they can get the antibodies, I guess. People can have more than one disease, but they didn't end up there from the autoimmune side. So I try to figure out how they ended up. If it was autoimmune, then I look, as you can see here on the slide, were they hyper? If they were hyper, that's the one I want to watch really closely. The good news, the United States, more most people are hypothyroid, which then gives us that 10% chance, which now makes it confusing. If we see one in 13 people that have thyroid dysfunction, why don't we see a lot of, you know, the orbital disease? Because a lot of it's hypo, just like one in 13 people have diabetes but we see a heck of a lot more retinopathy, right? We see more diabetic retinopathy, but there might be more people that have thyroid dysfunction than diabetes. Well, why don't we see the dysfunction? Because for some reason, some way, somehow, the there's only a 10% of the, of the people that have hypo that get the thyroid eye disease. So I'm really looking for you know, the hyper because they're really the high risk patients that are out there. So then you have the euthyroid patient, which we're going to talk about here. That's the person that gets the thyroid eye disease, but they're T3, T4, TSH. And I think I have a reason and, and backed up by some literature out there of how that all happens. So what causes this thyroid eye disease symptoms? Well, you get the T3 and T4, and then you get the antibodies. So I did lie a little bit. Um, 
Not much, but here's the key. When the thyroid and the, the hyper and that nervousness, so on and so forth, or the slowing down, you do get some eye signs from the T3 and T4 levels kind of being not in check. But when the endocrinologist gets that all kind of leveled out, the eye symptoms will go away. This is the disease part that we're going to focus on for the next, you know, say 20 minutes. This congestive autoimmune orbitopathy, this chronic inflammation from these antibodies attacking the orbit that's out there. So when you get the T3 and T4 boost, you do get on the hyper side from those excess hormones hitting the nerves, that spastic stare, dryness, lid retraction from the hypo side, things are slowing down. So usually periorbital edema. This is not what the lecture is about. You're going to probably miss that because the patient is kind of being treated. It's the other part of this right here now where we become the superheroes, right? This is whenever I say, yeah, I, you know, Sally, I think you do have a thyroid eye disease and the primary care and endocrinologist are going, you know, I like respect Greg. He's been in town for 28 years, but I don't know how the heck you can have thyroid eye disease because your T3, T4, TSH are normal. Has nothing to do with that in this congestive part. These antibodies have found the orbit and is creating that chronic low grade uh, uh, low grade inflammation. And we know that that's never really good. And there's this is all kind of changing now because of Tepeza, the inflammatory phase, the plateau and resolution phase, because that's kind of what we had to wait for the for the uh, antibodies to kind of burn out. There's only a finite amount of those cells, but now we can kind of intervene with Tepeza. We can kind of intervene with maybe treating the gut. Maybe we can intervene by giving them a good antioxidant therapy. So here's what happened to my guy. This is what happens in youth thyroid. We keep talking about these blocking. We keep talking about these stimulating. Well, what happens in hyper is, or the, well, the blue, we'll call those blocking. What happens in, in hypo is the blue come in and they suppress. But what happens if you get the same amount of blue and the same amount of red hitting the receptors on your thyroid? Those receptors are being attacked or being, say, speed up, slow down. So now you get that perfect amount of T3, T4. But so you don't get the dysfunction of the T3, T4, and TSH. This is what happened to my guy but you do have the antibodies being produced. And eventually these antibodies go and find this orbit, right? So again, the, all these patients have, you can see, look at the lid retraction, look at the bulgy eyes, look at the redness here on this patient, maybe a little burnt out over here, maybe a little bit longer standing. This would be say the passive phase. This would be maybe kind of maybe that plateau phase uh, that's going on. But these antibodies, whether they're the blocking, the stimulating, or the mix, are attacking these orbits, the fat, the muscle, and creating that chronic inflammation. Here was a patient that came in that, you know, let's as we referenced early, Sally um, came in and said, hey, I'm on, I'm on this Lotamax all the time. And, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I see these eye docs and I'm really not sure. They tell me it's allergy, but how can I have allergy in the middle of winter? And they tell me it's dry eye and, you know, and put me on these steroids. And um, I don't have a viral conjunctivitis. I don't have a bacterial conjunctivitis, but they have a conjunctivitis. And I look back and I see they're on Synthroid. And, um, you know, the T3 and the Synthroids being modified over these years. And I order the thyroid test. And if you look, you can see thyroid globulin antibody is less than one. And as long as it's 20 micro uh, uh, international units per milliliter, we're okay. Peroxidase is 11, as long as it's 35. And in this reference here that I'm using, but the patient here showed that it needed to be 1.3 or less. My reference here is 1.75, doesn't matter because 344 is just a smidge above that 1.33. And I hope you caught the, the humor in that, right? doesn't matter if it's 1.75 or 1.3. This patient's uh, thyroid stimulating immunoglobin was 344 international units per microliter, right? So whatever that times that is, 150 times uh, what it should be. Uh, and that is what was creating the redness in this patient's eye. 
despite her T3, T4, TSH being perfectly normal. So that's why you'll see uh, in thyroid eye disease, pain, lacrimation, uh, eyelid swelling, foreign body sensation, double vision. Those muscles are now getting so hypertrophied from the chronic inflammation, photophobia, you know, sensitivity. And then you can have as the muscles and orbit can, uh, can uh, I guess, swell, um, it can compress or create an ischemic optic neuropathy. So you can get loss of vision, which would be the worst thing from this condition. We were all taught no specs back someday. It's nice but it just reminds us what can happen. No signs or symptoms. You can get the lid retraction, soft tissue involvement, proptosis, extraocular muscle involvement, corneal involvement, sight loss, all things that can happen from chronic inflammation, right? But it doesn't tell us if it's active inflammation, passive inflammation. So we have no specs as a reminder that Patients come in on Synthroid, nothing happens, but we have either an 80, 10, or 10% hyper, hypo, or euthyroid of having them getting uh, some type of uh, orbital disease. And so this is all in there for your completeness. I can send handouts or whatever, but then there was the LIMO classification in 1991 that came out, reminds us, LIDS, exophthalmus, muscle, and optic nerve. And there was this whole classification. That's not what you need to remember. I'm gonna to get to the classification right here that you need to know, another clinical pearl, try to highlight them when they're out there. I don't keep this pasted on my wall. I don't keep this like, you know, like the pain medication at the hospital. Hey, look at Caldwell, have his clinical activity score. I practice with two computer monitors, and I can always Google clinical activity score. This is what you need to know if you're going to be referring for Tepeza. This is how you determine. The first seven are the important ones. So you go to Google, you type clinical activity score, maybe thyroid. This will pop up. All of these are worth a point. So in other words, inflammation of the caruncle or plica is not worth seven points. These are all worth one point. Pain on attempted gaze, one point. If you get to two or three now, this is what's changing. If you get to two or three and you they have thyroid eye disease, it now starts to become a good referral for Tepeza. And I say good referral or prescribing. I have an Oklahoma license. I don't practice there, but in Oklahoma, I could prescribe it and they could go to an infusion center. In Pennsylvania, I can't prescribe it, but I can work with the skin docs, the endocrinologist, whoever is doing it in my area, I can send it to them. They can then run it through the clinical activity score again and determine based upon whether or not they can get to PESA. So the LIMO, you don't need to know, no specs, but the clinical activity score is what you need to know because that's going to now give you the comfort level of when to make that referral for that infusion at least to the doc or for yourself. We'll circle back on a case on that. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly now. Remember, it's chronic inflammation. It's antibodies attacking the orbit, fat, muscle, conjunctiva, and you get lid retraction and lag ophthalmus when that happens. That's the lid involvement. And the lid retraction here is because of the chronic inflammation. And this occurs in 90% of the Graves patient. You get that excess stimulation of the Mueller's muscle. That's the T3, T4 boost. That goes away. But the chronic inflammation creates the, you know, the fibrotic inferior rectus, the mechanical restriction, the infiltration. And if you remember, the normal lid position is at 10 and 2 o'clock. And you can see here, this patient is pretty quiet, uh, but they have thyroid eye disease. The LeVon Grafe sign, when they look down, they, uh, they their eyelid stays up. Lag up thalamus, they're getting so much exophthalmus that they can't close at night. Soft tissue involvement. This is the one that's going to solve it in your office. These are the patients right here that you have in your office that you're treating with Lodamax, Maxitrol, Toberdex. Not sure. I would bet everyone on here, a Diet Coke, that if you go back, you have that patient. And I bet you you check tomorrow or the next day. I bet you they're on Synthroid and they have the conjunctiva chemosis and periorbital edema, just like this girl that came in. It looks like a viral conjunctivitis, but is basically a bad case of thyroid eye disease, the chemosis, the redness, 
um, the orbital structures that are being attacked here. Superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis. 65% of the time, it's SLK or systemic uh, or SLK. Uh, it's related to uh, thyroid eye disease. Let me re-say that because I got garbled it all up. SLK, when it comes into your office, 65% of the time, it is thyroid eye disease. There's your soft tissue involvement. Now let's pause. When it's not, look what it is. Rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren's. Say it. What is it? Those are two what? Autoimmune disease antibodies. I'm going to digress here a little bit off the thyroid. Remember how I told you that this is an orbital disease? Think about the eye. It's a socket. What do we put in it? An eyeball. And it moves around. Our eye is nothing more than a special joint that's out there. And if you think about rheumatoid arthritis, it's a disease of the synovial membrane. It's a collagen and elastin. So does our eye have a synovial membrane? I want you to think about that for a second. Does our eye have a synovial membrane? Must be because I'm asking it. We do, but what do we call it? It's called Tenon's capsule. If you look up Tenon's capsule, it's a capsule that you know, engulfs the eye, surrounds the eye, and it's made up of collagen and elastin. So that's why we get so many you know, rheumatological conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's attacking the eye because it has a synovial membrane. We just don't call it that. We just change the name because Dr. Tenon uh, found it. So we call it Tenon's capsule. So no surprise that SLK is related to autoimmune conditions. Almost a decade coming up here back in uh, 2013, Dr. Andy Morgenstern said, if the eye is red, think Ted. And boy, he, was he ever true? It's even to this day why it's important with all the different types of treatments that are out there. Periorbital edema can be a sign of thyroid eye disease. This infiltrate of orbitopathy, it could be unilateral, it could be bilateral. And it's permanent in 70% of the cases. I went a little quick here. Caused by infiltration, inflammation, fibroblasts, chronic inflammation that's out there. It could be unilateral. It could be bilateral. This looks a little bit uh, uh, um, burnt out. This one looks a little bit more active with the redness. Um, the number one reason the optic nerve gets crushed is not from an orbital tumor, it's from thyroid eye disease. When you talk to the neuro-ophthalmologist, uh, compressive or ischemic orbital disease is thyroid eye disease. Then after it is tumors. So tumors are rare, but thyroid eye disease is more common. And you can see from the MRIs what starts happening with these muscles. Look at this muscle in this eye, unilateral condition, Look at the muscle here and how it's pushing that eye out. And I got this from Elsevier 2005, where you could see how all the muscles here are very swollen uh, from, this, uh, from this condition. And the bony structure, which way does that eye get to go? It gets to go out. What's running through off the back here? about, you know, three millimeters wide because it's myelinated once it leaves and goes through the, um, uh, comes out of the optic nerve. The optic nerve head is one and a half, but then it becomes myelinated. So about three millimeters, let's say, but going through this muscle cone is that optic nerve and that's your ischemic or compressive optic neuropathy. Here is a, uh, uh, a chart that you might want to know. Um, you know, do I do uh, ex-ophthalmometry, Hertel or Ludi on all my patients? I have my technician do it. I do it on the patients that I identify as high risk. Autoimmune, hyper, hypo, or euthyroid. So as long as they are uh, autoimmune, if they had cancer, we don't do it. Uh, if they're on Synthroid and they were autoimmune, and we're looking for a two millimeter difference or anything above 24. And we kind of document that. And if we start to see changes, you know, we start looking at them closely and maybe they start needing to PESA that's out there. Uh, restrictive myopathy, that's how we end up with the uh, double vision. Can, now, I, IOP, can I interrupt for one absolutely. second? Absolutely. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Gives you a second to grab a drink of water too. Actually going back to the hotel, that was actually the first question that came through 
um, was, do you use it? So I know you just answered that question and I'll read directly from it. How the heck do you use it properly? <laughs> yeah, I always forget which one is the, uh, you know, which one is the little, you know, little glass rod and which one do you line up and so on and so forth. Um, I have them both in my practice. Um, we have six exam lanes. It's which, whichever one is there. Um, and you know, the, the one you put on the orbit and it's a little glass rod, you kind of have the patient look straight ahead and you get everything kind of lined up. And again, I'm just kind of my, you know, my technician's gotten good at it. We're looking for the two millimeter difference between the eyes. If she finds that she comes, gets me, um, or if there's anything over 24, but we do document it in the chart. We're looking for the trends and the one has the base level and you look through the mirrors and so on and so forth. I forget which one's the hotel, which one's the Ludi. We could Google it. Um, but again, you're looking for those differences. And again, there are some racial differences, you know, Asians versus black men and women and white women uh, that's out there. But again, that two millimeter difference or 24. Perfect. I, I had one more question that I'd love to ask before we get too far. Um, somebody asked, if we suspect thyroid eye disease, should the antibody testing automatically be ordered? For insurance purposes, do regular thyroid tests need to be ordered first? Um, no. If you're suspecting thyroid eye disease and the patient has not been diagnosed, then I would do both. I would do a thyroid panel and I would do a thyroid antibody. If the patient has been diagnosed and it's like, okay, I'm, I'm thyroid, I was autoimmune, I was sweating, I was cold, I was this, I was that. We know that they have thyroid. Are they getting their T3, T4, TSH checked regularly? They're going to know that because they all have all these apps now that they can log in and check their blood work. Um, if they haven't had a thyroid antibody, then you could just order the thyroid antibody. So it all depends whether the patient has already been diagnosed. You know, like my guy that came in, he had T3, T4, TSH so many times. I just wrote, I just ordered the antibody test. But if you're suspecting thyroid issues in a patient that is never been diagnosed, you probably want to get a thyroid panel and get the antibodies. To me, as the eye doc, the optometrist, the antibodies is what I order more of because the patients already come in knowing their T3, T4, TSH, and we're just trying to prove that it's a thyroid eye disease. Well, thank you. Keep those questions coming so that I can keep giving Dr. Caldwell a quick drink break as I read them. Um, <laughs> I will leave you to it, but we've still got plenty of time, so make sure you're using that chat and Q&A. Thanks, Dr. Stewart. And we were talking about the myopathy and it kind of makes sense here. What, what I haven't been able to figure out and through all the literature, why does the inferior rectus muscle most commonly involved? It probably has the most amount of receptors on it, but you know, why is that versus all the other muscles uh, that are out there? We'll talk about uh, IOP uh, in thyroid eye disease, but yeah, you know, here's a classic patient. You know, and this one could be missed. This is a guy comes in, you can see the double vision. You could see the lid edema. Um, you could see the redness that's occurring. Um, and this would be almost like a seven out of seven on the clinical activity score. Um, but this patient was seen, you know, before that was out and Tepeza was out. So you got redness of the caruncle, redness. This patient had some pain, you know, double vision. Look at the eye turn, the muscle involved. Definitely an orbital issue going on here. And now in this day, we hope we wouldn't get them get to this point, but we would want to get them for a Tepeza consult. Um, I think we all know how to handle corneal abrasion or exposure from lag ophthalmus. We talked about the muscles here and the ischemic or compressive optic neuropathy of that optic nerve, which can affect 5%. That's a lot. One out of five people with thyroid eye disease can end up with an ischemic or compressive optic neuropathy. And that's the blinding part of this disease that we want to be aware of. So treatments, this is totally shifting around right now. This is going all over the place. Um, we do know, I saw something really cool, is that orbital decompression, bone decompression, fat, bone removal, we're going to talk about that here in a second, going down. When you look at the billing of that from the surgery side, going down, and the reason of that is... Um, Tepeza. Tepeza was only indicated for, you know, people with threes and fours and active disease. And now they're looking at it and showing that it works in kind of a non-active 
way when the orbit is still, you know, not inflamed, but it's able to go in and reverse some of these, some of these findings. So where we continue to learn as uh, we use, you know, Tapeza that's out there, but the management look is controlling the inflammation uh, that's out there. So go through these pretty quickly. Cause I think we've all probably dealt with thyroid eye disease and we're trying to use lubricants and topical anti-inflammatories. You know, I'm thinking now that my bow is out, um, which is a really cool, um, uh, I, I got prescription, not artificial tear, uh, that is uh, a great lubricant for, uh, evaporative disease. I think that's going to kind of move up on my radar for these patients that are out there having that six hours of contact time up to six hours of contact time. Steroids obviously kind of put the fire out. We talked about orbital radiation and fat compression. These are dropping uh, as as we uh, as we speak because of Tepeza. Now we do know that smoking is bad in general. 2,000 toxins kind of hitting our body, depleting our antioxidant network. That's really the key that's out there. When we smoke, it really messes up that antioxidant network. You know, someone like myself that I, I try to take care of my gut now. From what I've learned, I take my antioxidants. I eat better. I'm exercising more, so on and so forth. But if I would smoke, it's not as bad as if someone has autoimmune disease. When someone has autoimmune disease and they you know, smoke a cigarette, those toxins get into the system. Man, you already got a heightened, dysfunctional, overactive, underactive immune system, and now you're adding another stress to it. So we always want to have our patients that smoke to come in, try to enter some type of cessation smoking program. But I beg, I grovel, I talk to these patients that are autoimmune and just try to have them stop because, man, they're just adding kerosene to the fire um, instead of water when that happens. And I know that there's probably people out there that smoke, and I understand um, the the receptors that get tickled. I know it, it's harder, it's easier to say uh, than uh, it is to fix. So I totally uh, understand that or to quit. So the paradigms are shifting. They're all over the place right now. Um, Tepeza is the, is the medication that has disrupted that. But to go through real quick, you know, you have, you know, lid taping and moisture goggles, I guess, kind of in that active phase. You have surgical management. Uh, you know, these patients can go see an orbital plastics surgeon like this patient did. She came in. She's like, yeah, my eyelid's been up, you know, for five years and no one says anything can be done. I have thyroid eye disease. And I'm like, well, you're kind of burnt out. Uh, looks like you're in that, you know, passive phase. Why don't we go see a lid specialist? and see if they can bust up that scar tissue and get that lid reposition. And you can see that uh, that was a success. Again, this is the patient that you're going to probably have in your practice. You know, you're probably doing artificial tears and ointments and steroids and restasis and Zydra and whatever anti-inflammatory it's out there. And it kind of is a form of a dry eye, but it's a, uh, it's a uh, inflammatory component. Uh, from this uh, from this orbital disease that's out there. And sometimes they do need, uh, you know, oral and topical steroids as the disease goes on. You know, someone comes in like this, they might need low dose radiotherapy. This was you would find. And part of my idea of making sure you understand that this is an orbital disease is that there are orbital disease specialists. Believe it or not, there are orbital disease specialists that can go in and do low dose radiotherapy, can do orbital decompression, go in and chisel out bone, remove fat to kind of free up that orbit from that chronic tight pack that can squash that optic nerve. So again, there are orbital disease specialists, maybe they'll become less and less, they were rare to begin with, but now that there's different treatments, so you would get an orbital disease consult. And I always kind of know where one is. I got one in Pittsburgh and one in Philadelphia in case I need to refer. The restrictive myopathy. I think we all kind of know how to deal with double vision with prism and so on and so forth. But then we can send them maybe to an adult strabismus once they're in the passive phase to maybe help get their eye realigned. Again, we all know how to treat this corneal uh, exposure the optic neuropathy, you have to hit it with some steroids, get them to that orbital disease, methylprednisolone, maybe radiation, Tepeza might take a little bit too long to work 
So then orbital decompression that's out there. And when my guy at Geisinger, who has no longer there, maybe there is another person because I haven't checked. I know I have someone in Pittsburgh and Philly, but then um, gave me this slide and said, you know, when I go in and chisel out bone, whether it is, you know, superior first nasal, we all know the inferior floor is the thinnest, but I thought this was pretty amazing. Anywhere from three to 16 millimeters of retro de, uh, retro placement of the eye. And you can see here, this patient had orbital decompression and you can see the improvement of her facial as disfigurement as we'll say here, because we'll talk about this here, is that thyroid eye disease and depression when facial disfigurement, like, hey, doc, why does my face look like this? I don't say to the patient, hey, your facial disfigurement occurred because you have thyroid disease. But I want to point out from some of these studies, and I lost the reference here, I, I must have deleted it, um, is that it's this is referenced and it's equivalent to the diagnosis of cancer in AIDS, right? So you can see here, if you use the clinical activity score, where this person would be, but they, you know, they might say, well, why do I look like this? Um, and this can lead to depression. So there's a high amount of depression with thyroid eye disease. So that's why you can see here with an orbital decompression, if this nerve is at risk, you could send them to an orbital disease and they can get that fixed. Now, hopefully what we can intervene with through maybe fixing the gut, we'll talk about that in the, in the, um, in the functional side of this coming up or, you know, getting some antioxidants or getting them onto PEZA, or what we call integrative now, using TEPEZA and using some antioxidants and helping this uh, to work together and get synergism, right? That's what happens. One plus one equals three when you start doing that. So the IOP that we talked about, I don't think the patient's IOP is going to be influenced by this amount of edema. It's not primary open angle glaucoma, maybe kind of a secondary-ish type. I think maybe the IOPs might be influenced here. Maybe here, this IOP is probably not the same as this IOP. These are more secondary. Probably these IOPs are probably not the same as they were 10 years ago. Um, and maybe this eye, which is trying to pull down and see, uh, not double, might be getting an influence. So again, not primary open angle, but more kind of a secondary influence. And maybe that would lead to some type of nerve damage that's out there. So we talked about the... Um, the different laboratory testing. This here is more complete in here for just for you to see it. You have the thyroid hormones, again, T3, T4. You have the commonly at, uh, tests that are done. This right here is where we as optometrists will become the, the, uh, the superheroes, as Dr. Lee would say, uh, that's out there is because you're gonna now learn to test for these antibodies in people that have, quote, normal T3, T4, TSH, but you think that they're getting the inflammatory part of this because of the autoimmune side. The thyroid has been attacked. The receptors are all damaged. The, the T3, T4 is leveling out, but now they're starting to get the orbits uh, attacked. So we talked about what happens in hyper and hypo. I'm not going to go through all of this stuff here. It's just in here for completeness. Uh, for the uh, for the uh, for the uh, for the for the for the presentation, this is a guy that came in. The date's important: February twenty fifth, two thousand and nineteen. Two things are that are important here. One, um, this person came in one year before Tepeza was uh, was allowed, and this person came in as a guy, and it was great. Everyone needs a Sarah that's out there. Sarah comes in and says, you know, hey, this was to the, you know, the ODMD practice down the road here. And they say nothing can be done. She comes out and goes, I think he just has thyroid eye disease. And boy, was she ever right. You know, you can see all the redness. You can see and it's missed because he's older and he is a he. Remember the seven to one ratio. And so it was missed being blamed as dry eye. And you'll see here that he has even double vision, I believe, as we go through the slides. Now, let's put him up here. He has pain feeling behind the globe. Yes. Pain on attempted gaze. He actually has double vision here. He's restricted. So, yes. Pain, uh, redness of the eyelids. Uh, yes. Redness of the conjunctiva. Yes. Chemosis. Yes. Inflammation of the eyelids. Yes. Inflammation of the caruncle and plica. Yes. These ones down here are for follow-up. So you can skip eight, nine, and 10. 
he's seven for seven. He would have been a great candidate for the clinical activity store. You can see the double vision in this eye from the muscle infiltration. Basically, the short of this story is that I sent them to the rheumatologist. The rheumatologist started some IV steroids. It started to help him out. And then he ended up um, through when COVID came, moving down with his like son and daughter or you know, son-in-law and daughter down in the uh, uh, down in the Pittsburgh area. So I lost track of him, but you can see, you know, we started treating him aggressively through the rheumatologist. Uh, and you could see that the swelling started to go down, but it needed something a little bit stronger than Lodomax. You know, he had to go oral. We had to go injection. We were worried about his nerve snuffing out here. So we were able to kind of free him up here. Now you'll see what happens in the in these later ones by keeping them on that. You'll see the fat distribution that occurred. And this is the drawback of steroids, right? He starts to get this. It will go back. You'll see, you know, he doesn't have the, the fat redistribution that can occur with steroids. But, you know, we were treating um, this. And so as we go through here, um, again, he ended up, you know, moving down into Pittsburgh. It was before COVID, but he ended up staying down there after COVID. So I thought this was pretty neat. Um, this was sent to me um, because they know I lecture in here. Methylprednisolone, early response to intravenous methylprednisolone therapy for restrictive myopathy. And that's what he had in this eye right here. You can still see he has the eye turn. You know, I love this here. Um, this is through... Uh, Elsevier and uh, they they send these out every you know every day and I click on the ones um, and it says you know in this the take home manage, in this study the authors evaluated the therapeutic effects of intravenous uh, methylprednisolone um, and basically it said no specific factors were identified uh, in increased risk of worsening strabismus although the intravenous methylprednisolone may be helping mitigating the inflammatory phase of thyroid eye disease, there may be associated worsening of the strabismus and muscle myopathy. So that's why now I try to avoid this. When treating thyroid patients with restrictive myopathy, like right here, physicians should be aware of some patients show worsening of the strabismus. Really, the crime's not fitting the punishment, and that's why we want to move into something like Tepeza that is more targeted at treating this condition. And I have no financial interest in Horizon and I have no financial interest in uh, Tepeza. Um, so again, you could see here that he did improve over time. Um, and I'm hopefully that he's on Tepeza because you can use it. You can see the eye turn right here. The redness definitely has improved. All right. So and I saw this back at one time right there, 2018. You know, Helio Primary Care Optometry News. I was really excited. I lectured on this before, try to understand what was going on um, with these antibodies, autoimmune. And teprotumumab, a, an insulin growth factor one receptor antagonist antibody demonstrated improvement. And this was before it was approved. And it was talking about Tepeza and Horizon has brought it to uh, market here. Its headquarters is in Dublin. They have a Chicago base here. And this is a, a, um, a biologic. Biologics are super complex. It's an, it's an antibody that you're going to see. It's an insulin growth factor receptor monoclonal antibody. And it's made through the Chinese hamster ovary. That's the way a lot of the biologics are. These are super complex. They have a whole biologic lecture I can do. But they're huge molecules. They're very complex um, and that's why they're expensive too that are out there. It's Padufa date was March of 20. It was actually, I think, released in, in February. And that was COVID year, right? When COVID was getting serious. Talk about a drug being released at the best or worst time. Um, February of 20, right? When COVID was, people were talking about it. And we all know what happened in March of 2020. But see here, this is right from their website. You can go right to their website, Mechanism of Action. You can see it's an orbital disease. Those antibodies are attacking the orbit, the fat, the muscle, the conjunctiva. And we want to put that fire out. Now, what's really cool is if you look at this, think of this as a muscle. This is a fat cell. 
what happens? You hear overexpression, underexpression. You have this receptor. And in this side, what it's showing is you have the insulin growth factor one receptor. You have the thyroid stimulating receptor. This is where the thyroid antibody comes in. And when this insulin growth factor receptor uh, antibody comes in and hits this, and it's overexpressed, this is what creates the inflammation. It's this beta arrestin. It's like a linking receptor type of, uh, of uh, I guess, structure. Once this and this, it kind of, this is now all becomes one from this beta arrestin. Now that's important because what Tapeza does is it goes in and competes right there. It's a fully humanized monoclonal antibody. It goes in and it's attacking on this side. And what it does is it shuts it down, stops the inflammation. That's good because of this beta arrestin. It connects it. So it kind of just down regulates and starts calming down uh, the inflammation. So that's why it's important to recognize these people with the thyroid eye disease, get them onto the clinical activity score and off for teperitumumab. Now this TRBW means absolutely nothing. It's as if someone leaned on a keyboard. Um, basically, there's no generics for biologic. So if I come out with a biologic, if they give me the DNA sequence of, of this insulin growth factor one uh, antibody, I can go make it. Um, I might not use a, a, what is it, a Chinese hamster ovary. I might use E. coli, spin it up, do whatever, and they, it's still going to be called teprotumumab. How do you know it's horizons versus mine? They'll put two, four different letters at the end because you can't have a generic. It's a biosimilar. All right. Immunosuppression. We have Remicade, Humira that are out there. And you can see that these are big boy immunosuppressant biologics, which are used still to this day in some patients for thyroid eye disease. It's off label, but it's okay if you have it. At least it's calming it down. Um, these are immunosuppression. Anyone that comes in, I kind of coach them on Tepeza because it's more immunomodular. Lots of side effects. If you ever saw a Humera commercial, it's like five seconds on what it does, 25 seconds on all the side effects, tuberculosis, this, death, blah, 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 blah. You know, Tepeza, it does have its side effects, but it's not like an immunosuppression. It's an immunomodular. I'd, feel, I'd encourage you at the very beginning, remember I said, uncomfortable, bust through, learn about it and get into a new comfort zone and learn how, because here's a patient right here. If he would have come in now, I would definitely be sending him off uh, for a Tepeza consult. So it did come to market. Um, there's, look, it fixes proptosis, diplopia and the quality of life score. It came to market. It works really well. There was different ones that were out there. The, uh, what was it? The uh, optics and optic X. And actually, they're starting to find even better results and other ways to use this in the chronic patient, the patient that we thought was burnt out, and they're using it and finding that we're getting improvement. Sometimes you'll see hyperglycemia. Remember what this medication works on, right? It's working way over here on the insulin growth factor one receptor, so you can get a hyperglycemia. Now, Hyper versus hypo. Hypo kills people when it goes too low. So I'd rather it go hyper, um, but you can see some of the other uh, side effects, nausea, alopecia. You heard of some of this hearing loss. If you watch TV and you're like, hey, did you take the Peza? It's kind of an already people have hear hearing loss and it can make it worse. And some of it's returning, but the guys that are and gals that are doing the infusions know how to handle all of that. Again, and all the biologics at times can get an infusion reaction, but uh, the hyperglycemia um, is, you know, one that you'll see on TV because of that insulin growth factor one that's out there. So I would encourage you maybe to go to their website. Um, the people that are infusing this are all over the place. Um, it could be oculoplastic stocks. It could be neuro-ophthalmology type of docs. Um, it could be endocrine uh, endocrinologists that are out there. Uh, so I would encourage you to kind of find out who in your area, maybe by going to their website, calling them up, asking them who in the area. So when you do get this re person that you can send for a referral. I, I see you there, Jen. So I guess I, there's some questions. You answered like three of them in your last few sentences. So. <laughs> 
So there were quite a few questions about Tepeza. So, um, but you did answer a number of who people would send to for a Tepeza consult. Um, and you did actually, the hearing question did come up as well, um, which you did answer. How long can Tepeza work for? And the second part to that question, are there any rebound effects after a certain period of time? Yeah, those are those are great questions. And I think, you know, the, the best way to think about it is this is a broken, overactive uh, uh, immune system. So it's hard to put a number to that, right? You got some people that are early in the disease, still have a lot of uh, receptors, fat and orbit in their eye. You've got people that are late of the disease where maybe the antibodies have attacked those receptors that look, eventually the receptors will get damaged and the antibody just doesn't have anything to attack. So it depends on where you are in that disease. We used to think it could be active disease, but we have people that have coming in with these kind of bulgy eyes for a few years and there's docs actually injecting and it's reversing some of this, you know, proptosis. And, and so it's, you know, we thought it had to be active disease. Now it could just be kind of non-active, but chronic inflammation that's out there. So I would just say, stay tuned, talk to your MSLs, the medical science liaison, the science. So the difference out there when you have a sales rep, they have to stay on, 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 on the label. That's where they get in trouble, but that's why they have these medical science liaisons. I love my salespeople, but they always got to stay on label. You can really geek out the medical science liaisons. If you have a lot of questions, I would encourage you find your medical science liaison, ask your sales rep. They have to connect you and boy, you could geek out with them with some fun. Thank you. Uh, you did answer actually most of these. Um, one other question was, and I, I think you have answered this mostly, you would treat their eye symptoms while they're on Tepeza and keep that as a palliative treatment versus referring to Tepeza and saying like, that's the cure and that's all we can do. Yeah. I think that was part of the uh, question I didn't answer. So they kind of resurfaced again. So thank you for asking that question is yes, we're going to kind of palliate because these patients are going to respond to different ways as they go through this treatment over the whatever it is, the the eight weeks or however, you know, the it's maybe somewhere in here, it's a clinical activity. It's eight infusions every three weeks for 24 weeks. So as they go through the six month treatment, you know, it's slowly kicking in and so on and so forth. So we're kind of managing them, their steroids, their lubricants, now their MIBO, so on and so forth. So yes, we're kind of, you know, following them up, answering their questions and seeing how their eyes are improving. And they, can you explain where they go for this treatment? There was a question about what an infusion center is. Yeah, so they they could be really anywhere. They get trained by Horizon uh, on this. Um, so again, um, neuro ophthalmologists I've seen do it. Probably the majority of the people are the oculoplastics docs, um, but the endocrinologists that are doing it, whether it's for diabetes or thyroid, um, some of the rheumatologists are doing it. So it's really all over the place who gets trained on it. Um, so what I would do is, again, encourage you to just call them up, call the 1-800, go to the website, look for someone in your area and put in your zip code and you'll find who's doing it because it's a plethora of specialties that are doing it. Perfect. Well, I will let you finish. I know we're getting close. Well, getting there. Um, yeah. So please keep putting your questions in the chat and the q and I'm getting to as many as possible, but I know there's a lot more questions. So I will pop on in a few minutes. Okay. So really, this is the last slide before we jump into some of the functional stuff here. You can see that these are some of the biologics that were used off label. And it's just that these are some big boys. And remember now that we have this insulin growth factor one, which is better than going after tuna necrosis factor alpha. These are all part of our immune system. Interleukin-6 is very important to our immune system. So when we start tinkering with it, we start getting some bad side effects that's out there. So this is not as common. So you start getting less side effects, immunosuppression, immunomodulary. All right. So some of the stuff that I want to cover in the next 10 to 15 minutes is optometry's opportunity. You know, have you have seen this patient come in, they have hypothyroid and they have very thin lashes. They have lashes to their upper lid um, that are kind of say um, missing or very, or being damaged. It's part of this immune system, this autoimmune. 
So eyelash brow and eyelash loss in hypothyroid, hyperthyroidism is an unfortunate side effect. Dry, brittle hair, thinning, scalp, so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, the eyelash business, the United States, it's one point, I think, seven, five billion dollars projected to go to, you know, four billion dollars. So this is optometry's op opportunity uh, to take, you know, advantage of this and help coach our patients. You know, a lot of the current therapies that are out there, like bimatoprost and Lash Boost, um, they contain isopropyl. I don't know, cloprostinate. And these are synthetic analogs. So you look at this name here, this isopropyl uh, cloprostinate, and it doesn't look like um, latanoprost other than it has this prost in it. And it's a synthetic analog. And there's a lot of them on the market. I'm not saying all of these are, but I just kind of screenshot some of these that are on the market. And I should put in here, I'm getting lots of side effects. I have people that are trying to grow them, using them twice as much, getting these red eyelashes. I have people doing tattoos. And this came along um, that is through New Skin, and it's called New Color. It was re released on June 22nd. It's available in the United States. It was been over in South Korea and Japan, which is the aesthetics capital of the world. And it's formulated with natural extracts and peptides, um, prostaglandin free, it's BAK free. It uses potassium sorbate because it is a reusable bottle, it lasts for three months, twice a day. No RX is needed because it's sold in our office or you can prescribe it through a link or so on and so forth. And there's clinical studies. And this is probably one of my favorite pictures from their clinical study. They use this special photography where it showed the before lashes and the after lashes. They're not claiming to create lashes, but they're taking what's already there through the antigen phase. And over four, eight, and 12 weeks, you could see uh, when they use this kind of tape that's come in a controlled environment, how the lash has, has grown and become thicker, bolder, and longer. So, you know, this is our opportunity, you know, in thyroid disease, I offer this a lot. I just offer it in my office because I just say, hey, look, during my eye exam, are you using any serums? And they'll look at me and I'm like, well, no, I have this natural. And sometimes I'm like, well, I wasn't, but maybe I will now because I didn't realize that there was a non-prostaglandin using three peptides, five extracts, not BAK, not creating the iris and skin color changes, not a prescription, uh, one bottle is five milliliters. It can last two to three months with a sh three year shelf life. Hopefully I can move it before three years. Favorable pricing at about $70 a, a bottle. And you're able to capture that $1.7 billion US market uh, that's out there. And, you know, it's new, all natural, kind of new to the United States. Uh, which is is uh, really nice. And it's been great for my, a lot of patients in the practice, but this is a thyroid and I've had a lot of success. Now we want to talk about the functional inter inter interventions that are out there. The immune system support. Remember, we have a dysfunctional immune system, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, macular degeneration. And for tonight's talk, we're talking about um, thyroid and thyroid eye disease. Why do we have so much autoimmune? You could Google it and you'll start saying pollutants and the foods that we eat and our gut microbiome is getting a little dysfunctional that's out there. Leaky gut, which is leaky poop that we talked about earlier. Our immune system, we want to support it by giving it as much of the chemicals that are needed. Now, remember I taught, told you about um, Philomena, but this is the A4M. This was James Laval. And he talked about oxidative stress and inflammation, hormonal balance, stress hormones, gut integrity that's out there. So optometry's opportunity, or what I like to call it optometry opportunity, is I like to think about as I can work on people's antioxidants, I can work on their gut health and their skin from the inside, maybe through collagen, which supports gut and it's all kind of like in this little Venn diagram overlaps. But this is where I spend a lot of my day. Started here, and then I usually start here and move over to gut health. And I think we all agree that chronic low-grade inflammation, science has proven that low-grade inflammation is the chronic killer, and that's why the rest of the world is here. 
why our expenditures through life, and my dad went through this for about the last eight to 10 years, and I'm trying not to be my dad and having cardiovascular disease and diabetes and retinopathy and trying to stay active and put this all off. Chronic low-grade disease creates any of this, right? Cancer, slow burn diseases, cardiovascular, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and look right here, autoimmune disease. And that's what we talked about tonight a lot was thyroid eye disease being autoimmune, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's, uh, all the atopic dermatitis. And Philomena here was really awesome. She's like, everyone thinks that you should take selenium and zinc because when your T4 is produced, it has to get converted to T3, and that's what goes to the cell nucleus to then work. But she's like, yeah, that's awesome if you can get the T4 produced. Don't forget, when you're at the gland, you need iodine, you need iron, tyrosine, zinc, selenium, E2, B2, B3, B6. These have all been proven through science is what you need here in order to produce the T4 to then be converted. So yes, selenium and zinc are important, but you need a lot of components. And that's why I'm an antioxidant comprehensive type of guy, no matter what condition it is, because we want to support this. Now, what happens when it gets to the cell nucleus? Well, you finally get the T4 converted to T3 through selenium and zinc, but now you need vitamin A, B2, B6, B12, exercise, iodine, selenium at the cell nucleus. And that's the difference of a hormone. Hormones work at the nucleus. Kind of that's why vitamin D, it's kind of the only uh, hormone that is not made. Vitamin D is a hormone. It's not made with a gland. It's made in our skin, the largest organ of our body through that conversion. And it works at the nucleus level. That's why vitamin D is so important. Thyroid dysfunction uh, inhibitors that are out there. Stress, you could see fluoride and the toxins and selenium deficiency. Where is 90% of our selenium made? In our gut. Starvation and the different types of cortisol, how it all ties together. And you could see the toxins and the infections and so on and so forth that occur. But she talks about oxidative stress. And so that's why I love using this scanner in the practice. I think this is, again, optometry's next opportunity, identifying these patients under oxidative stress, right? It's doing testing through carotenoids. You could do it through an MPOD. We've, we've heard of MPOD testing. It's just, I think we misinterpret the test. If you're low in carotenoids in your macula, the science has shown you're low in all your antioxidant network. The blood work has shown that. So if I scan in the hand and I'm low in carotenoids, that's the biomarker being used. The test is telling you you're low in all your antioxidants. So we want to replace it. And there's a another hand scanner out there that was released by another company that's using um, it's using reflectance and not Raman spectroscopy. Some are saying influenced by hemoglobin and the skin color. I don't care how you measure whether it's reflectance, whether it's the hand scanner, by spectroscopy, or through the MPOD, as long as we interpret the test, the carotenoids are low. It's not like dumb luck that the rest of the antioxidant network is fine. Your polyphenols are great. Your resveratrol, your vitamin D, everything's good. And just by dumb luck, you happen to be low. The blood test, the science has shown multiple times that you're low in everything else. So it was developed by the National Institutes of Health for Cancer and Macular Degeneration Research. And that's why this is life pack that's being used. It's a comprehensive formula that mimics eight to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables that are out there. So do you think that patients come in that have diabetes, that have rheumatoid arthritis, that have macular degeneration or getting a hand scan? And do you think I'm trying to support them and get their immune system as kind of functional or support it? That's where you hear it supports the immune system. Heck yeah, I am. And getting them on something to help calm them down. That's called integrative medicine or integrative optometry. We're still using Tepeza, but um, integrating and things become synergistic that are out there. So there's formulas out there that we can use. So oxidative stress, she just pointed out, there it is. It's always at the top of these functional medicine talks. They always talk about oxidative stress, then hormonal balance and getting back to the gut. 
So how about this that's out there? This is the relationship between the gastrointestinal health, micronutrient concentrations, and the focus on thyroid. It's all referenced right here. This was the figure showing one in five with Hashimoto's has this whatever this APCA, I have to go over here and see what the initials here are standing for, but it's basically talking about a gut issue, decrease iron B12, and now we have this uh, thyroid uh, symptoms uh, that are occurring. And then here, key thyroid nutrients, B, D, iodine, selenium, magnesium, zinc. This is why, you know, I have moved beyond carotenoids. Carotenoids are super important. They are one heck of an antioxidant, but our body needs a ton of nutrients. So you can see here, as these nutrients drop, look what starts happening. And then look over here with the probiotics. So gut treatments improve thyroid, right? So that's why I kind of focus on patients. Look, reduce the thyroid antibodies, decreases TSH. So do I put patients on prebiotics and postbiotics and so on and so forth? Yes, the, the, the company that I work with has those that are out there and for the patients that are interested. So the gut microbiome is super important. Prebiotics, fibrous compounds um, that the good bacteria in your intestine can feed on. Probiotics, people think they have to recolonize every single day, 12 months out of the year. You don't. I recolonize a couple times out of the year for as much traveling as I do go to the academy in a few weeks, stay up late, drink some alcohol, so on and so forth. Probably after that meeting, I will do some probiotics, but I take prebiotics and uh, anthocyanins every day to support those. And we're really starting to now understand postbiotics that's out there. So stay, you know, stay focused on this. Again, it's a huge opportunity here for optometry, wherever I have this slide, is there's a huge op opportunity out here for optometry. And I would encourage you to kind of focus on this. Look at those different types of um, natural ways, functional medicine ways out there to, to help our patients. And this is my last slide here. If you ever play Trivial Pursuit of Thyroid Eye Disease, as I was putting this lecture together, I never really remember all these different eye signs uh, of thyroid eye disease that were out there. But there it is, trying to land it right on time for us, Jen. Dr. Stewart, uh, uh, 1013, we'll take a few questions. And I think that there is a breakout room following this.